Welcome to Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Friday, July 21st. I'm your host, Tom Moore. The Notre Dame game is in 43 days, the game against Michigan in 127 days. We are picking back up with our season preview series today with the Iowa Hawkeyes. They are back on Ohio State's schedule this fall for the first time since 2017. You may recall how that one worked out for the Buckeyes. Uh, and it looks like it's pretty much going to be another solid Kirk Ferentz Iowa team. So my guest today is Chad Leistico, he of the Des Moines Register. Chad, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I appreciated the last time we talked and looking forward to this one, too. Yeah, when we talked last summer, we talked about how consistent the Iowa program is right now and how the outcomes kind of vary from the good Iowa season where they're, you know, things really come together and they win 10 or 11 games. And then, you know, what qualifies as a bad Iowa season now is, you know, think nothing works and then they went up, you know, win seven or eight games. Last year was very much a good Iowa season. They got to number two in the country in October. They finished the regular season 10-2, and two, lost to Michigan in the Big Ten title game, and then a close one against Kentucky in the Citrus Bowl. But, you know, it feels like offensive line play and a solid defense are, you know, more or less a given most seasons. So what is the difference between the good Iowa seasons and the bad Iowa seasons? Uh, yeah, it's it's usually close games. That's that's uh, a frustration, I think, among Iowa fans in a way that, that Iowa plays so many close games. I mean, look how bad Northwestern was last year, for example. And Iowa had to hold, you know, they had to get a late interception to hold them off 17 to 12. And that was a bad Northwestern even. So, I mean, uh, they were winning a lot of games. I think we, I think they were 7-0 and before the bowl game. 7-0 and in games decided by... Uh, 10 or less. So it was a lot of close games. Um, a lot of, uh, and that's usually how it is under Ference. I mean, you think back to kind of the meltdown season way back in 2014, uh, which I know Iowa hasn't even been to Columbus since 2013. So um, <laughs> we're going back in the memory bank here. But uh, uh, that was a season where it was, Iowa went seven and six, but like, you know, the last two losses were to a really good Wisconsin team with Melvin Gordon by two and then a Nebraska team that was actually pretty good by three in overtime. And, you know, that is, that was the difference between nine and four and or nine and three and seven and five that regular season. So that's kind of usually what it is for Ference. And I, as you look at the Iowa schedule, especially just playing in the big 10 West, it's just most of these coaches try to play close games. And that's true for Fleck as well. Um, it's true. For, nobody really tries to blow anyone out except maybe Nebraska and Purdue, I suppose. But, um, you know, but uh, it's usually a bunch of close games. And uh, so that's kind of the, the separation. I happen to think Iowa has a really good roster this year. But the biggest question really is just going to be, can they get the quarterback play they need to push them over the top? Because they were an elite defense last year for the most of the season anyway. Uh, Big Ten championship game, probably an exception. but. You know, they were 121st in total offense, which is crazy for a 10-win team. I mean, you look at the nine teams below them in FBS, and they were rotten, rotten teams. Like Indiana was just barely below them. <laughs> you know how bad their offense was last year. Um, so uh, that's that's the big question with this Iowa team. The defense should be great. The special teams should be very good. Um, can the offense with the quarterback play do enough? Yeah, that quarterback position is always kind of a question mark with Iowa. I mean, that's, I think that probably goes into why they play so many close games. If you're scoring 24, 27 points a game, even with a good defense, that's going to lend itself to a lot of close games. You know, that Big Ten championship game last year, I remember watching the opening drive for Iowa. They go right down the field, had an open open receiver in the end zone, and missed the throw. And it was like, oh, that's it. Okay, they, they're going to lose this game because they can't, they can't waste opportunities like that. This year, the then quarterback battle... Football. Yeah, then they missed the field goal. Yep. Yeah, that was that was, you know, you sometimes you can just tell and it was like, oh, this game's already yeah. over and it only it's only only yeah. three minutes in um, this year. The yeah. quarterback battle features a couple of guys who we saw a decent amount last year. Spencer Petrus, Alex Padilla, you know, neither one was incredible, but they I mean, they did enough to win in the Kirk Ferentz system last year for the most part. So is there a sense for who's going to win that starting job this fall? Uh, the Iowa fans uh, just ha haven't really fallen in love with Petrus. Uh, you know, he's missed a lot of throws in the Citrus Bowl. I mean, even even that game, uh, they were driving with everything going wrong in a lot of ways. Um, they were driving with a chance to tie or win in the last minute and inside Kentucky territory down three and, you know, kind of throws an inexplicable interception right into the Kentucky linebacker's arms when, you know, easily could have just thrown it away. and. Uh, 
wasn't even really pressured. So um, that's the kind of stuff that frustrates Iowa fans. Um, yet that said, uh, he has the full support of the coaches, it seems. I mean, he went into spring number one. Uh, he's, I would say he didn't uh, stand out compared to Alex Padilla or Joe Labus, who's from Ohio. Um, there's a lot of buzz about him, actually, as a third-teamer. Uh, but, um, you know, Petrus comes out of spring number one and goes into summer number one, and uh, there's really – all the talk is he's going to be the starter, and I don't think there's any way that he's not the starter unless he's hurt. Um, so I think it will be Spencer Petrus for the third straight year. Um, his record's not bad, obviously. Um, uh, he missed some starts in there, but I want to say he's uh, – ah, gosh. With the COVID year, you mess up the math. But he was – they went 6-2 with him that year. And then I guess last year, um, yeah, he he did not start – uh, three games, so he lost. He lost all the ones that you know, all the losses were when he started. So I guess they were. I guess he was seven and four last year. So what does that make him? Thirteen and six. Thirteen and six is a start, which isn't bad. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's like it's it's an optical thing sometimes. Um, but he's the quarterback, and he's got a he's got a strong arm. He's got he's a really likable guy. I mean, he, he seems like he can do just about everything except scramble. Um, it just it sounds like he's great in practice, but just the game sometimes um, leaves something to be desired. And so that's the frustration among Iowa fans, uh, the concern among Iowa fans, because you look at Iowa's schedule, and we were talking before that we'd recorded here, Tom, but the, the initial part of the schedule is uh, manageable. I mean, they could easily, not easily, but they could win their first four games. South Dakota State will be t- difficult. Iowa State will be difficult. Nevada at home and then at Rutgers. That's not it's not impossible. They're 4-0 going into a uh, Michigan game on October 1st. And if they're 4-0, you know, Petrus is still going to be the quarterback. So, um, you know, that's almost like the, the fear among Iowa fans, you know. Like, uh, they're, even if they're not looking good, he's going to stay with it. But at the same time, there's still a belief that he could – kind of have that breakthrough year. Don't forget, he did not, that COVID year, he got zero spring ball. He got very, very little fall camp as a brand-new starter. They lose their first two games, and then they reel off their last six and were were easily the best team in the Big Ten West that year. Um, Just, you know, happened to be a weird COVID year when Northwestern played one last game, and they lost head-to-head to to Northwestern. So, um, uh, by one, by one point. So, um, I don't know, it's just, it, he, he's, he's, a, he's a polarizing figure just because people want more, but he's such a likable guy, and um, even in the media, you feel like you, you want to see him do well because he's just so, he's, he's kind, he's, <laughs> he's respectful, he's funny, he's, uh, he's just a, everyone loves him in the locker room, and I think that's one of the reasons that he's their quarterback because he has, he has the locker room. Well, the rest of the offense, they're, they've they lost several guys. They lost Tyler Goodson. He put up more than 1,100 yards on the ground last year, missing some receivers. But uh, stop me if you've heard this one before. I was looking pretty good at tight end this year. Sam Laporta back, Luke Lachey, uh, son of uh, Ohio State uh, legend and current uh, yeah. radio color yeah. guy, Jim Lachey. He's back this year. Then up front, I mean, the offensive line is a little like Wisconsin to me, where it's like you kind of know what it's going to look like. And then the question is, where does it fall on the spectrum from generally pretty okay to really outstanding? So overall, how, how good is this offense going to be? Oof, boy, that's the big question. I mean, that's been pretty much like 70% of what we've written this off season. Just curious, curious how it's going to look. I will touch on tight end here for a second because you did. Uh, yeah, that's definitely the strength of the offense. And I definitely, uh, suspect Iowa will use a lot of 12 personnel, you know, one running back, two tight ends, because they really, really like Luke Lachey, as you mentioned, has the Ohio ties there. Uh, but Sam Laporte is probably one of the three best tight ends in the country. He had a real hard decision whether to come back or or go to the NFL draft last year. Uh, he was their, the first tight end to lead Iowa in catches since 1991. So, you know, he's uh, he's definitely a weapon that that tells you a little bit about where they were at receiver last year, but still, uh, he made he had like a hundred and 
almost 130 yards receiving in the Citrus Bowl. He's just a really, really good player. Really good player. He's an NFL player. Uh, and then throw in Lachey, who's all of six foot six, maybe even six seven, uh, at, at the other tight end. And then they they brought in a uh, transfer from uh, FCS Lafayette named Steve Stilianos, who I think is going to really be a factor to to give them some depth. Um, so they're really good at tight end. O line, um, you know, really, I know from the outside, you know, like you just mentioned, Tom, like the presumption is Iowa's offensive line is always going to be decent or good or better. But last year really was kind of the weakness of the team. And they were so bad at tackle at times that uh, Petrus, that was a big part of why Petrus was up and down, you know, that they couldn't block Aiden Hutchinson. I mean, what do you do? <laughs> you, just, you simply can't block a guy. You can't really do much. Um, so they should be better at tackle this year. Uh, they're two, probably their two best linemen are going to be Mason Richmond and Connor Colby, uh, two guys that that just got their feet wet last year, but they're really athletic and big and young and talented guys, both high recruits, four-star recruits. They should be good. Uh, it's it's funny. They're just they're trying the Tyler Linderbaum plan all over again. I mean, he was the best center in program history, uh, obviously a first-round pick of the Ravens and just dazzling them, it sounds like, up in Baltimore. Uh, you know, the Remington win or whatever, but, uh, you know, he was a converted defensive lineman. And so they've taken another defensive lineman and put him into center. Logan Jones is his name. And uh, he was a defensive lineman, you know, last season. Now he's a center and he's looks like he's going to be first string more than likely. So um, it's kind of like uh, they're trying to recreate Linderbaum. He's even going to wear the same jersey, 65. So, um, that's the type of thing we're dealing with, you know, looking at this Iowa offensive line. A lot of young guys. I suspect you'll see four sophomores and one senior um, starting for the Hawkeyes this year. So that's young. And they got, I mean, they've got, they've recruited well at that position. I don't know if we'll get to Caden Proctor later, but, um, you know, he's not here yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, they've got young guys coming up, but it's that's going to be a work in progress. And, um but it's it's got to be better. It's got to be better. Um, I think that's probably the biggest concern, even more than quarterback, to be honest. But uh, at the same time, you know, like you said, a, a Kirk Ferentz line, typically you think they're going to get there. Um, but it is a concern. That's why it's you don't know what to expect from this offense. And on the other side of the ball, you always kind of know what to expect with the Iowa defense, and it's – you look at the pieces and it's like they've got some you know they've got some solid pieces and they've got some solid players and they don't do anything fancy they just kind of they do what they do and the results are always just really really good and you just kind of want like how how is it is is it really that simple they went 29 games in a row without allowing 25 points that streak ended last season but i mean this year's defense shaping up to be really good again and the front seven returns a ton of talent it just it seems like a year when it, i mean I think it's going to be hard to hold Ohio State under 30 points, but just about anyone else on that schedule, I, I mean, I I don't know that I see anyone else on that schedule necessarily cracking 30 points without, you know, turnovers or whatever, maybe playing into it. This just seems like this is going to be a, you know, a, on the on the good to great spectrum, potentially a great-ish Iowa defense this year. Yeah, we'll see. Um, we'll see how good it be. I, it can be. I just wrote a column um, for this past Sunday's Register about you know can this be Phil Parker's best defense yet? Um, yeah, and that's a legitimate question, I think, because they uh, they basically bring back you know, nine of their top ten defensive linemen, and and all all of them can play. Um, they're, they're very. It's very deep. A very deep defense this year. You don't necessarily have the superstars, although. At the same time, you know, they've got two first-team All-American preseason guys, and Jack Campbell, a middle linebacker, and Riley Moss, a corner. Uh, Moss, the returning Big Ten defensive back of the year, even though he missed like three and a half games last year with an injury. Um, so he's uh, – they they should be – their linebackers uh, should be outstanding. Um, you know, I mentioned Campbell. Seth Benson um, is, is an undersized guy, but he'll be an NFL player. Um, and, and I'll, minimum special teams and and then an ohio guy justin jacobs uh, he was he in the recruiting process i don't know if folks remember but he was down to iowa and ohio state um and uh he picked he stuck with the hawkeyes and i even thought this offseason because he didn't see the field as much last year i thought 
I wondered if maybe with the transfer portal and whatnot, hey, Ohio State could use some help on defense. Here's a 6'4", 240-pound guy that can run who is absolutely one of Iowa's three best linebackers, but but they play a four two five, and so he doesn't play every down. So uh, I wondered if maybe he might think about transferring, but he says he never did. Um, he's uh, he's on NFL draft boards despite not really starting. Uh, but so they're just loaded at linebacker. They're a little young in the secondary in some spots, but they've recruited so well, and that's the best position they have. Uh, as much as you want to talk about tight end and no line, but. Uh, the position they really put into the NFL anymore is is defensive back under Phil Parker. So, and as you know, as Ohio State fans know, in in 2017, I mean, JT Barrett I think came into that game with one pick, and he threw four in that in that game in Iowa City. Three of them to, to uh, Josh Jackson, who was the you know Thorpe finalist that year. So they they've got just a ton of guys. So they they should be built for some injuries. Um, you know, I think the you look at the Michigan game last year and the in the Big Ten title game, and that's concerning. I mean, they, you know, I think they got exposed a little bit there in some areas in terms of athleticism and whatnot. But um, I don't, yeah, Ohio State matchup uh, that's that's beyond scary. But the other eleven opponents, you know, I think they'll be okay. You know, normally normally when we're doing these shows, if we're talking Notre Dame, we're talking Penn State, you're talking Michigan. Those are schools where you end up having a lot of recruiting overlap, and that's sort of a big story. Ohio State and Iowa aren't typically recruiting against each other, and when they do, you would typically expect Ohio State to win. I mean, you can go back to uh, A.J. Epinesa a few, you know, a bunch of years ago now, but, uh, you know, Caden Proctor, who's someone you mentioned earlier, 2023 five-star offensive tackle. Ohio State wanted him. His final two were Alabama and Iowa, and he picked Iowa. Uh, Xavier Nwampa, five-star safety last year. Ohio State really wanted him. He picked Iowa. You know, these are, you know, these are recruiting wins. This is, these are the types of players that Iowa, you know, Iowa has not typically done it with five-star players. They've, they've done it with the gritty three stars and development and all that kind of stuff. So what has changed? Has something changed in terms of Iowa's recruiting? Where, where is the, you know, I mean, typically there are not five-star players in the state of Iowa like Proctor and like Nwampa. So there's, you know, that's a little bit of an outlier, but what is Iowa doing that all of a sudden they're seeing so much more success in recruiting? Yeah, I think uh, this could be a really long answer. I'll try to boil it down as best I can. But I think what you're seeing is in in today's world of, you know, oh, I want to go to this school. I want to go to this school. I want to go to this school like Iowa. Iowa really preaches its stability. Um, it, it, it points recruits to the fact that if you stick with us for four or five years, we'll get you to the NFL. I mean, at, at an unbelievable rate. And uh, I think that I, I do think, you know, you, you saw TJ Hawkinson and Noah Fant a couple of, you know, obviously after that 2018 season um, be first round draft picks and then Tristan Wirfs uh, the year after, and you know, the year after that or a couple of years after that, I'm losing track of time now, but um, it was, uh, you know, and then of course, Linderbaum was first round pick last year. Uh, it, it just, they have, they're continuing this to point people to this track record of hate, you know, you can go and get, uh, you know, whatever you want, two hundred fifty thousand dollars of NIL here or whatever. Um, you know, here's what we can get you at the end of your Iowa career with an NFL contract. Our coach isn't leaving. Uh, these, you know, these guys. You know, Kirk Ferentz just signed it through the twenty nine season. I mean, that was something that happened in January. So that's another little bit of news. Um, you know, since we last talked. Uh, so I think that's helped a lot. Um, yeah, it's it, it is interesting that they're recruiting so well um, without really offering any NIL money to prospects. That's that Ferentz doesn't want to do that. Uh, he wants all any NIL money and to go to at least collective money to go to existing roster players, and um, so that's the plan. He doesn't. Caden Proctor turned down. He told uh, a TV station over here, he turned down $250,000 from, I can't remember who, one one of the schools. Might have been Oregon. I think it was Oregon. Um, And, uh, you know, got zero from Iowa. Um, So uh, it is is unique. Um, I think think what happens with the, um, you know, racial uh, 
bias, uh, uh, controversy, outcry, investigation, all that that happened in the summer of 2020, I think that ultimately ended up being a real positive for the program uh, on the other side of it because it, it has become, um, you know, you can tell what, by the, who they're recruiting. I mean, the, the, the recruits, the recruiting classes are becoming much more diverse than they were in the past, and, and things are going really well by all accounts. Um, with the culture of the team, they li everyone likes each other. Um, it's, it's, I mean, when we interview these guys, it's like, they're just all such like really nice guys, you know, like they, they just are recruiting really, uh, good guys who work hard. And that's kind of, I think they've done a good job finding like the four star types that are wired the same way. Xavier Wampa is exactly that way. He's very serious about school, quiet kid serious about football and that's exactly the type of guy that iowa wants anyway he just happened to be a five-star you know an hour and a half west of iowa city so, and saying you go you know proctor goes to the same school and and wampa you know shared i'm sure shared good things about, and they're good friends uh, about the hockey program so it's a definitely a chance for iowa to gain some recruiting momentum they'll never ever be on the ohio state level or michigan or anybody like that but um yeah, maybe they can maybe they can make a run here in the Big Ten West for a while. I guess as long as we have a Big Ten West, but uh, we'll see. Well, you talked earlier kind of about the front half of their schedule when we were talking about quarterbacks, and you know the front half of the schedule is pretty manageable. I would like to talk to the person who thought scheduling South Dakota State was a good idea. It is not. It is never a good idea. Don't do that. But you know the rest of this, the rest of the first half of the schedule. You know they get you get Michigan at home, but they could very easily be say five and one coming into that Ohio State game. If everything breaks right, maybe you're six and zero. Oh. The back half of the schedule is a little tougher. You're at Ohio State, home for Northwestern, at Purdue, home for Wisconsin, at Minnesota, and then they end with Nebraska at home. So, is this another nine or ten win Iowa team, or is this maybe more of the eight ish win range? Where, where do you think this team maybe ends up? Uh, you know, Las Vegas, you know, has them at. The Usually where they always have them, seven and a half is kind of the over-under if you look at those things. Um, so that's kind of the expectation, I think, uh, nationally. Uh, you let, I mean, what's uh, – it, it's so crazy. I, in the Big Ten West, Iowa has completely dominated three teams, and they have so much trouble with the other three. The, the three they dominate are Nebraska. They've won seven in a row. <laughs> Minnesota, same thing. And Illinois, I mean, that's not as big of a surprise, but, uh, you know, they've, they've just overpowered, you know, Minnesota and Nebraska, yet they have so much trouble with Purdue every single time. They've lost four. The, they're one and four against Jeff Brom. I mean, Brom has like a losing record at Purdue, but uh, he's four and one against Iowa. And, uh, you know, so that when you mentioned the back half of that schedule, yeah, Ohio State and Northwestern's another team they have a ton of trouble with because they, you know, such a smart, well-coached team. Um, and then uh, same with Wisconsin. Wisconsin just has Iowa's number typically, um, including last year. So, yeah, the back half of that schedule is tough. I definitely think, I think they're going to have to go at least five and one in that first six to to get to a nine-win season. Uh, but that's kind of where I've got Iowa right now. Probably nine for me. I think this is the best team in the West. The schedule is tougher than probably anyone in the West, unfortunately, for Iowa. But I still think they're the best team. And uh, if they, they get Wisconsin at home, so, you know, even if you lose to – and I think Wisconsin plays at Ohio State, yes. right? Yep. yep. This year? Yeah. So that's kind of a – you know, both give them a loss there. Um, you know, I think uh, I think Iowa still got the best shot of anyone in the West, even though I think Wisconsin has the best odds. Um, but Purdue's dangerous too. Purdue's dangerous too in the in the West, and you know, Iowa. Right now, Iowa fans hate Purdue more than anybody because they just took two receivers from their roster and plugged them into you know a team that's already beaten them. And I mean, they were the team that came into Kinnick last year when Iowa was number two and six and zero, oh and took it to the Hawks two twenty four seven. Um, Iowa Iowa fans were so happy to see David Bell go to the pros. I mean, that was like. It was like the the biggest celebration of the off season to see him declare for the NFL draft was <laughs> for Iowa fans. So, 
Yeah, you, you don't need to tell a podcast whose audience is mostly Ohio State fans that, uh, you know, Purdue can make your life miserable. Ohio State fans have learned that lesson uh, multiple times over the last 20 years or so, and even a little before then. Um, but yeah, sounds sounds like this might be a, a team with a good defense that it ends up in that nine-ish win range and is maybe playing a bowl game in Florida early in the afternoon on New Year's Day. This this is all sounding very familiar uh, with uh, with regard to the Iowa program. Um, will you please let people know where they can find you on Twitter and uh, where they can find read your work as we're uh, heading into a year when Ohio State and Iowa are finally playing again for the first time in five years? Yeah, I know. it's funny. They haven't played. Uh, they played once in the last decade, basically, since 2013 in Columbus. And, um, you know, they might fail. If if my predictions are correct, uh, they might play twice this year. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, so uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Ch- at Chad Leistico, it's a weird spelling. Uh, L e i s t i k o w. Uh, I do have some friends. I have a lot of Ohio State friends in Columbus, so uh, maybe they're listening. So good to t- good to talk to you folks. Uh, and I'm at the Des Moines Register, uh, Iowa's biggest newspaper. But we have a website called HawkCentral.com. So can uh, you know? Whatever that game is, what, October 22nd? So, yeah, you can, if you want to log in to hawkcentral.com on the week of October 16th, uh, yeah, you can find some stuff about that game. And both teams have a bye ahead of that game, I noticed. So it'll be a two-week buildup to, to uh, Iowa at Ohio State. Just like the Super Bowl. Can't wait. Uh, Chad, thanks. thanks again for joining me. You bet. Thanks, Tom. Well, thanks again to Chad for a great conversation, and thanks to all of you who have helped us get the word out about the show. We should be up on most of the major podcast platforms by now. YouTube will be coming soon. I know people like to watch there. We will get that ready as soon as possible, hopefully in the coming days. Uh, And you can help other folks find the shows by sharing a link on social media. We also really appreciate everyone who's left us a five-star rating and a short review on whatever platform you're listening on, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anything else that lets you rate the show. If you can rate us and you leave us a five-star rating review, that will help other folks find the show as we start at our new home now. So uh, we will be back with a new episode next Monday. Uh, Then it is time for Big Ten Media Days in Indianapolis. Football is almost here. I can't wait. I'm guessing you probably can't wait either. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday.